Bible, you might as well get it out because you're going to need it. Revelation chapter 13. This, this picture that the book of Revelation is going to give us here in a moment out of chapter 13, you're going to think, man, that must have been one ugly looking creature. That baby looks like it was holding her up there for a minute. I didn't take it. And the Lord of Lords. That's what I'm looking for. And 
if the world gets that in onto their mind instead of worrying about what's going to happen next, we're going to find out that God's still in charge regardless of whether you worry about it or whether you don't. But you'll do good if you realize that God's in charge and let Him take, take care of it, and whether it's you ain't having to worry about how it's going to turn out. If you turn it loose to fear and into the devil, they, don't, they ain't no idea what would come from this thing now. And it would all be on your side. Those that just goes right along with the program and everything and don't, don't, don't let it bother them because they know that God's still in this thing, you know, is the one that's going to have peace of mind when they hear the trumpet. I call it when they hear Gabriel to that bugle, that bugle every now and then. But so they're going to hear it, and it's going to be loud enough that it'll wake the up. I'll tell you that. Now, let's get, let's get some deeper here. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him power, and his seat and great and his seat and great authority. He put him in the place that he wanted to sit. Okay, the dragon, and he gave him the authority to sit there, and great authority to rule from that seat. I saw one of the heads that it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things. And the blasphemies of the power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now, and he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God, the blaspheme his name and the tabernacles and the thing that dwell in heaven. And, in, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and, to power, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth. Earth shall worship him whose name was not written in the book of life and of the Lamb, book of the Lamb of the life slain from the foundations of the world. The names were not found written in his book. But it says the Lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. <coughs> that means when this thing all started happening, the foundations of the world. We really look back to the creation when God created this, this thing we call a mess right now. You see, all this stuff was done way back yonder. That's hillbilly, but that's what it means. Way back yonder. That's where it, when it happened. You see, there's nothing new. God knows it all. He hears all. He sees all. He knew exactly what this was going to be. He knew about the Tower of Babel. You can't pull any surprises on God. God's not up there waiting to see how you're going to handle the next moment of your life. God already knows what you're going to do the next moment of your life. Some of you are going to take this message, you're going to run with you're going to say, oh my God, this is what I've been waiting to hear, this is what I need. And some of you are going to say, well, I don't know where you're getting that from, but I sure don't get it. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. Why? Because you're not looking for it. You're looking for the bad side of something to happen. Remember I told you earlier in the very beginning of this thing that, that if the devil finds out who you are and that you know who you are with God, he's in trouble. Yeah. You can make him walk a chalk line. He can't come against you, can't tear at you or nothing. If he finds out who you are, you'll find out that when the devil finds out who you are, he'll start leaving your family alone. You say, well, I don't believe that because they got... Well, if you don't believe that, you ain't going to get it. You understand what I'm saying? Every time somebody brings something to you that's positive, you say, well, I don't believe that. Why did Jesus die on the cross if you're not going to believe it? The chastisement of our peace was, was on him before in Isaiah 53. <coughs> okay? It was the chastisement of our peace. Peace means... You're at ease with what it is that's going on around you. I got news for you. It's not the the Democrats or the Democrats or however you want to name them. It's not that. 
But this thing is what's happening in this world. God is tightening up on the rope. He's tightening up on the rope and he's doing it on both sides. And I'll tell you one thing he is not happy with and that's that abortion thing that they got going on. Those babies, I'm telling you something right now, they don't have to worry about no Lamb's Book of Life that's been aborted because they are martyred for Christ right now. Everyone that's been aborted. Because they're doing it to get them out. To get it out. Bring somebody in this country that don't have any, any chance of being a Christian. Somebody else that don't want to be Christ-like. Somebody that wants to rule with a rod of, of, of iron and stuff like this and just to take advantage of somebody. And we know who that would happen to be. And it ain't, it's more on the socialist party side. We're not going to go in politics. We're going to go back to this year. But now I'm going to say this to you too before I get in deeper in that. How many of you remember reading about the hour that Christ was on the cross? Or the hours? Things that happened with the Lord Jesus Christ while he was hanging there. Some of y'all have heard all your life. And the one that sticks out in my mind the most is when Jesus was hanging on the cross of Calvary and he forgave the thieves, or the one thief, and told him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I, I get that. I love that part. Makes me want to shout when I think about how that he, 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 he saved that boy that was, was a thief. And Barabbas got to be set free and him a murderer. All those things happening at the cross, those are things that, that we can really get into in life and have big whoopee services over. But what about when him on the cross of Calvary, he's hanging up there real high and he's looking out over this, this multitude of people that's watching him be betrayed here on this planet. And as he's been betrayed on this planet, his life's blood is dripping off onto the ground and his head is starting to swell up so big that you wouldn't know who he was or couldn't recognize him because he told his mom, he said, woman, behold your son. I'm your son. How do you like me now? Like Toby Keith, how do you like me now? You're not standing on this cross. I'll nail to this thing. How do you like this? And he's looking out over the, the multitude of people that's standing there, and they're all raving and, and ranting and saying, die, 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 you know. And anything they could come up with to blaspheme his name, they were doing it. And what does he do? He stands there while he's looking down on them. His head drooped, and his body started being weakened and everything. And he looks down and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. <coughs> Lord, they're just ignorant. I wonder how many times he's had to say that about Dan Cross. Lord, he's just ignorant. He don't know any better. He don't know any better. But he's filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit will teach him better. Somebody says, well, the Lord just whooped you in the plate. No, he won't. The Lord will talk to you in a still, small voice. He says, you're not going in the right direction, son. I don't care what kind of circumstance he'll put you into. He'll put you somewhere, whether you'll be in a, in a place, or whether you won't have nobody to talk to but him. I remember one time, I, I love this story that I have, because I was at a, a wit's end one time. I was... I was in a church over in Southern Indiana, and had people over there would move. That wasn't a good place to be, I can tell you that right now. Because I was fighting a denomination that didn't believe in nothing. And they were Baptists. They only believed what they had were their, their, their books that come out of Virginia. And trying to make us apply them there in Southern, and those people down there would have owned that church and could apply a bunch of stuff in there. But those people was in a position to where they, they could have done a glorious work in that town. But they were so wrapped up in the traditions of what their mom and grandma had. I, went, I told them they, had, they was serving too much in the first chapter of the book of Brandy instead of serving the word of God. But you know, when you look at the things that people get in their hearts, 
And they claim for it to be the Word of God because they'll pull one passage of Scripture out. And then they quote it wrong. You don't know what that means. Because you don't take the time to study that passage of Scripture and see what it actually means. But well, when you read it, you already know it. I don't care if you can quote every book in the Bible, word for word, and never miss a word. You still don't know it. Because every time you go back over it, you're going to learn something different. There's always a new message every time I hold the Word of God. But look at it as Jesus, he said, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Lord, it's Danny again. Forgive him. He don't know what he's doing. There's been more than one time that I've got down on my face before God and said, I'm not going to preach anymore. I didn't him come and bring me to a point where I changed my mind in a hurry. And I said, Lord, I'll come back, but I ain't preaching. I ain't preaching, I'll come back. Just forgive me. He never said, oh yeah, you're going to go preach? No, you're good. he never said nothing to me. So a friend of mine decided that we needed to have a singing group. We used to sing country music all the time. Let's just build us a singing group. We can build a good group. And we'll just have a good, good time running up down the road singing for people. And it worked out too for a while. But the first week, the first singing that we went to, we went over to New Paris over here in uh, Gilmer Smith Church over there. Some of y'all may know him. <coughs> Gilmer Smith is one of the pastors in that church. He called us over to, to do a singing. Well, it looked like half of Richmond would come over and they found out that Harvard Spark was over to sing the gospel in the church and Dan Brown's were going with him. So we go over there and get over Smith's and we start singing and I testified a little bit after I got done testifying about how they had been out in the world and everything for so long and now our lives were trying. Gilmer stood up right after the trouble with and I was sitting down there just waiting to get back in front and get the equipment so we'd get out of that place. And he said, I'm going to ask this young man right here to come back and preach for us next Sunday night. And I said, okay. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there and it's almost like I can hear God go, <laughs> You know what? I never said I ain't preaching no more. Not after that. There have been times I thought that I'd thought that I'd wrote it. I couldn't. But when you get on your face before God and you say something like that, you'll say, I don't make mistakes. I called you to go preach. You see, when God saved you, it took the power of conviction to be over your life. You knew you needed Calvary. You knew that you needed the cross. You know you, you needed that sacrificial forgiveness prayer that Jesus said when he said forgive them for they know not what they do. See, he looked down through the years. He already seen, he already knew exactly what was going to happen. I want to ask you something. How many of you believe that Jesus knew everything that was going to happen to him on the face of this earth? Before he came, he already knew what kind of pain he was going to have to go through. And I said, well, I don't know how about that. Yeah, he did. That's what makes it that so beautiful to me. He knew exactly what man was going to do to him. He didn't have it too hard. He sure didn't have it easy. He knew what it was going to be. Those stripes on his back, he knew. That, how do you know? Well, the Old Testament was telling him, so who is the Old Testament? In the beginning, the word was the word. The Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Now, did he not know it sure as them prophets? In the Old Testament, prophesied the Lord Jesus Christ's death? He knew. Because God is a spirit, and him that worships him must worship him in spirit and truth. The Spirit of the Lord <coughs> confirms to you that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive and well today. You see, some of the stuff that we've had Jesus buried under a church pew somewhere and think we can pull him out every time we want to use him, 
You're not going to reach up there and get him if he ain't going to come out. You see, it's up to him. It's up to him to whether the Spirit of the Lord is pulled out in just one or two people in this church or whether it's pulled out or poured out into all the people in this church. And it'll be according to the hearts of those that are in the church. It won't be according to what I want you to bless me, Lord, so I can look good from that church. I want you to make me a deacon so I can be somebody in the church. You're already somebody in the church. There's not a person in this church that's not valuable to God. You're not junk. There's not one person here that's not valuable. Amen. God needs us all. He just chose me to lead, that's all. That's all it is. I'm just, I'm just a leader. But before I ever was able to lead, I had to prove to him I could follow. That's the problem with the church today. A lot of people want to lead before they ever follow. And the first thing you've got to learn to follow is the Spirit of the Lord. If you can't follow Him, the church ain't going to follow you. I know churches right now that probably got four to 5,000 people in them. And if you start looking for the power of God in there, and the power of God in that church is how much money they can take in. That's a lot of power. Take the money away from it and close the doors. I'm going to tell this story in closing. Dan Schaefer, back a few years ago, back in the earlier years of my ministry, they asked him to, he had been with the church and, and he left that church and they, the church out there in Texas, I think it's Cornerstone now. They came to him and asked him if he would come and pastor the church. And they told him, said, we can't afford to pay you what you're worth to come and preach. He said, the Bible says that I'm worthy of my heart. He said, yeah, I know that. He said, why do you say we do it like this? That I'll come over and pastor that church and you give me 10% of the offering. He said, that'll work. We'll build a church on that. They took him on that. He goes over there and sometimes he got nine, ten dollars a week for offering. That was the tithes of the money that they were taking in. But then that church started growing and grew and grew. And all of a sudden, Dan Schaefer's salary was over two hundred and fifty thousand a year. Then they wanted to cut his wages. He said, he's making too much money. He said, I'm still making 10% of the offer. That's the contract we made with together. That's the contract you made with God. They said, we're going to have to cut that. We're not going to pay it. They wanted to hire more people to work in the church. So he said, fine, let's get you another pastor. And they was okay with that. That's good. We got money to buy another pastor now. And they bought it, and they bought it, and they bought it. And all of a sudden, a friend of our wife was going to work at church. And before we know it, that new pastor is gone from the church, and the church is split. We know it right in the middle. And if I said his name, you'd know the one that's in there now and brought that thing back to life. And I guarantee you, they ain't getting him for no $90 a week. <laughs> because the Bible says a man will be worthy of his hire. Be worthy. You know, as long as I've got about enough money in my pocket or enough faith in my in my heart to go any time that I'm called on to go work do the work of the Lord. That's all I need. That's all I need. Somebody said, Well, what do you mean? Every time I need something, I just ask God and I get it. I just ask God. He never fails. Amen. You can ask my wife anything I've ever asked her. I've got it. And I've got it in abundance. I've got it in abundance. I'm one of the most humble men that I know of because I don't depend on nothing except God for our blessings. 
when something comes up, a need comes up in our house, you can ask me, because we learned a long time ago in Whitney County, Kentucky, just ask God, it's there. Or just ask Roger. I want to give this testimony too. We needed a, a walk-in shower. And you know how God blesses me. Not just any old walk-in shower will do. Uh -uh. It has to be one of the walk-in showers that's going to cost you over $2,000 to go out to buy it. Now Roger found one. And what was it? $400 or something? $400 he found that thing for. Brand new. So we went up there, looked at, that, <coughs> looked at that thing, oh yeah, we wanted Dr. Logan to go bring it back home with us. Brought that thing back, but the other blessing was on it. Don went with us and he paid for it. I had money to pay for it. Don wasn't going to have it, he paid plenty of it. And Roger gave me a a big blessing that day. But he, God worked through Roger to get it. I got that thing in my house down there and, and Randy, the only way I can get him in it is throw him in it. <laughs> 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 it's the truth. And man, I got a big nice shower in there. It's like four by five or something like that. A big old shower. And he'd walk in there. He, you don't have to get out of there and change your mind. I'll tell you that right now. But he... Got him a place that he can go, and God bless. You see, when you depend on something, we've always depended on God to keep our family safe. And we have a, a little girl in our family now that's two year old, or will be your director. That there was drugs in the umbilical cord when they took her sincerely. We almost lost that baby. She was premature. I can't remember what she weighed, but she could sit like this in the palm of our hands. Or lay like this. But now she looks much, it looks like Masha and the bear. Her feet move just about as fast as she runs. Because she's real hyperactive. She got and she loves her papa. Not this one. Her other papa. Son. But she's getting where she's coming around for me. Why? Because family loves family. And it doesn't matter which one of you gets down in the dumps or gets down in your, your luck or something like that. Your family members are going to be there to give you a hand and help you out. But yet the church family is so much different. Whether they have a tendency to say, well, let them get out and get them another job. And I've had people tell me about some of these people here in, in Richmond, Indiana. That if they find a homeless man, I try the first thing you do is they get on, on the eBay or whatever you call that thing, you know, on Facebook or whatever it is. And the first thing you start doing is blasting those people. You know, I don't know what's going on through their head that they don't work. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to give them money without praying for them, and I sure ain't going to talk about it if I ain't praying for them. Okay? Because we never know. One day you may be in that same circumstance. There was a guy in St. Leon, and he, he owned nine-tenths of a mile. Back over the hill, right behind 70, going through the 74, going through into to Harrison. And he'd go down to Cincinnati and beg, have somebody drop him off down there. He'd go down to the preacher store up. He'd go down there and beg. He'd go back there in the afternoon and get him, bring him back home. I always thought he was ridiculous. He could make more money, money selling some of his junk. He had to land around his house. But he was saving that for his retirement. He retired in the nursing home, and that's still there. The people that bought the property of his son and his wife is the ones that got to do what he had left on that property. You know, we have no promise of what's going to happen tomorrow. But I'm going to tell you that 
the truth, and I'm going to tell you this, and if I ever tell it in my life, it's today. Jesus has got all of your circumstances under the blood. The devil's not going to throw anything at you that he does not know about if you're his. Calvary took care of that. And this message this morning may seem like it's not a very good Easter message, but I can tell you something right now. Somebody's getting this, and it's getting beat inside their heart. Somebody is getting this. So God does not give me a message. It's not, not something there for you. I got a lot more scripture I can use, but I'm not going to take it too far in it now. One passage of scripture can save the world. One or two words can save the world. I got enough notes here if you want to just, and I don't know about scripture. You know. This thing will tell me what the preach God does. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Okay? God ordained Christ's death. That's all I put in there. Okay? And that was to keep me from forgetting it. Now, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 3, I'm not going to go read it. Because we're not going to have to go there now. But I can say this, and it'll, it surpasses the understanding that I have, except for one thing. I know God, and I know how God works, and I know what He does for me, and I know what He'll do for you. When I was out on that bulldozer down there in uh, uh, Brookville, before we ever started building our house, I was sitting down there with one of them old Alex or something. Way back in there and moved out. I was sitting back in there, sitting on that bulldozer, and all of a sudden I just leaned back and that big old cushion it had on it. I was meditating and thought, thinking because I didn't know where I was going in the ministry at that time. And I started wanting to see some things before me as to what was going to be happening. I've been praying hard for it. And I was sitting back there on that bulldozer, and all of a sudden, it was a pretty hot, you know, sticky type day. And all of a sudden, here comes this breeze across that bulldozer. It was one of the most pleasant breezes I ever felt in my life. And right in the middle of that breeze, there was a song that was coming through there. And that song was singing, The chimes of time, bring out the news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. And was that someone you knew? You know you have known. For added strength, your courage to reveal. Do not be disheartened. I have news for you. It is no secret. What God can do. What he's done for with arms wide. 